and welcome to The Smartest Podcast. I'm Melissa Peck, founder of Smartistry, and I'm so excited to be with you for another terrific episode. We often on this podcast talk with creatives and artists about what makes their practice work, um, how their practice intersects with finance and with entrepreneurship, but today we have something a little bit different, and I am Really excited to dive in because today we are joined by our special guest, Ilya Zlotkin, who is an entertainment lawyer with the flat uh, with the firm Zlotkin Can Entertainment. Um, so we are going to dive in with Ilya on some terrific uh, questions that are really timely, um, things that I'm curious about um, for sure. And so Ilya, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Melissa. Happy to be here. Let's dive right in. Um, first of all, let's learn a little bit more about you, Ilya, and what kind of legal services you provide. Can you talk to us about who you typically serve? Who's your typical clientele? Sure. So uh, specifically, or broadly, I should say, entertainment and media is our primary area of focus. Within the last year, we've pivoted our firm to tailor almost exclusively to that field. Uh, now we're based in Chicago and Chicago as a market is relatively small. So you don't just focus on one particular type of creative, uh, at least not if you want to have a sustainable business. Um, so, you know, we work, I would say our number one area is, with, uh, is within film and we work with uh, producers, but then also all of the service providers along the way. Uh, realistically, you're not making a film by yourself. So it really does take a team and that leads to a lot of relationships and relationships often are accompanied by contracts and hence lawyers. Uh, other than film industry specifically, uh, we certainly work quite a bit in music. We work with uh, clients in radio, um, also theater. Uh, all sorts of uh, web-based businesses uh, work with some, uh, we'll call them influencers, everyone else does, uh, really across different platforms, people that have built a following and who are leveraging that following, uh, we work with them. And uh, if it's, um, if somebody calls themselves a creative, uh, that's a good niche for us. Um, you know, something that I think often slides under the radar. A lot of marketing companies are, at the end of the day, creating content, and they're looking for ways to protect that content, commercialize that content, and so we work with them as well. So if it's got something to do with uh, entertainment, media, creatives, well, that's exactly in our bailiwick. That is so amazing. I cannot wait to ask you lots of questions about things like intellectual property and some of the recent changes that are going on in the news these days about intellectual property and um, contracts and all that stuff. So we're going to dig into those topics in a little bit. But um, I was curious, like, why entertainment law? Where, where did you get started with this and, and how are you evolving in that direction? When I went to law school, which at this point, I graduated over 10 years ago, uh, never thought of uh, being an entertainment lawyer, uh, had just this general idea of I'm going to do transactional law, whatever that means, right? So I guess not litigation. And uh, that's what I was studying, didn't know what intellectual property meant. Uh, I remember distinctly in law school telling friend of mine that they needed to like patent a book or something and they very you know pedantically corrected me that it books need to be copyrighted and not patented so, so like truly not in any way had, had any sort of uh, prior experience with IP uh, prior to law school uh, you know went through law school uh, just coincidentally ended up getting the intellectual property certificate at my law school because you know the credits lined up uh <laughs> did take an entertainment law class also because it worked with my schedule at the time and uh you know when i 
graduated again, just truly had no uh, plans to be in entertainment law and quite frankly, no plans whatsoever to even have my own firm. Uh, you know, somebody were to ask me at the time, have you thought about starting your own firm? And my answer would have been, yep, thought about it and probably not for me. Uh, wouldn't know what to do. Also, there's so many potential ethical pitfalls. I'd lose my license before even having a chance to use it. Uh, at least those were, you know, the fears. But of course, you know, I graduated. Uh, I went to law school in Virginia. And so when I moved out to Chicago, I didn't really have much of a network. Very difficult to find a job. This is back in 2013, 2014. And uh, a mentor of mine suggested, hey, have you thought about starting your own firm? And I, I answered in the way I just mentioned as far as what my thoughts on that were. And he said, well, you know, it's not easy, but it's easier than you might think. And so uh, I ended up nominally, at least, launching my own firm. This was back in June or April, maybe 2014. So, uh, of course, very quickly you realize the main question isn't really about how am I going to do the work or how am I uh, going to navigate the ethics of, of it all, but instead it's where do I find clients? And again, I didn't have any sort of network, um, so I had a lot of time, I guess, on my hands because I didn't really have the clientele to service. And uh, I... I remember I signed up for this website called Avo. Uh, anybody that's familiar with lawyers is probably familiar with it. It's like a Yelp for lawyers. So, you know, if somebody's got a law license, they've got whatever technology that scrapes the internet that automatically creates a profile for somebody, uh, regardless of whether they've claimed that profile or, you know, any plans on marketing themselves. So, I ended up claiming my, my profile and, you know, putting in whatever my information was and saying that I was focusing on business and obviously that I was in Chicago. Well, Avo has a, probably still does, has a very aggressive marketing department and they start calling you uh, and uh, trying to sell you sponsored listings. And they were offering to sell me sponsored listings for a business lawyer in Chicago. And, you know, of course, they're very high demand listings, so they're very expensive as well. And so I was thinking also to myself, why would anybody out of all the bajillion business lawyers in Chicago choose me rather than somebody with more experience? You know, all, all the, all the self-doubt, but also quite justified, I think, you know, when people are choosing attorneys. Uh, and so... I wanted to know a little more about their less in demand listings because I assumed that they were cheaper. And so I asked about entertainment law and I asked about, I think, international law. And because they were so much more niche and less in demand, they were much cheaper. And I thought, okay, great, let's roll the dice and set up uh, these sponsored listings uh, with me being listed as an entertainment lawyer. And uh, again, I'd had very marginal experience up to that point because, you know, in law school, I didn't just take a course, you know, I participated in a legal clinic. That's when law students under the uh, supervision of, you know, a professor, a licensed attorney provide services to real clients, um, you know, for free and law students get experience as a result. So I, I'd been in a clinic like that in law school and had had some very limited client work in the space, uh, obviously on top of whatever value cl taking classes brings you, right? So I start uh, being listed as an entertainment lawyer on the internet, and I start getting calls uh, on the topic from people that found me on the internet. And of course, the not every call that I got was a worthwhile lead. Although, of course, at the early stages of your business, you're like, oh my gosh, I got a call. You know, that's, that's amazing. Um, but it forced me to really actually 
start learning and, and being able to answer questions. And, um, you know, I started volunteering with lawyers for the creative arts also as a, as a way to just try to get some real casework and, and real experience. Uh, and so really from my marketing myself as an entertainment lawyer, I became one <laughs> and, uh, that, that was true. And, but at the same time, I was far from the only area that, uh, I was practicing in. I still did quite a lot of work specifically within corporate, uh, law and, and then also intellectual property unrelated to entertainment and media, uh, and really a variety of just business law. Uh, entertainment was always an area, I, I would say 30% of my business was, was in the space. Uh, and then more recently, I, so my current firm is not the same firm that I started way back when. Uh, the current firm is almost four years old. And, uh, within the last year, I've had some positive breakthroughs where it's really started to make sense for me to, to focus specifically on entertainment and media, uh, and, you know, start to offload work that doesn't necessarily fall within that niche. Uh, it makes it easier to run a business, um, and you know, it's going, it's going well right now. Uh, as far as why specifically this area, after a couple of years, uh, being involved, even though I never intended to be, um, I figured out that I like the people I'm working with, uh, in particular because they're long-term minded. So they're not, um, pe people are not focused on, you know, immediately getting something, uh, or at least a return on a relationship, right? And that lined up with uh, what, how I was approaching uh, just my career in general, because I was at the start of my career. I was never going to have, you know, more experience than really any other lawyer that uh, was in the space at the time. Uh, but what I could do was devote time to building relationships, building trust. And, you know, even now with the benefit of a decade of experience, like the, the stuff that I do is replaceable easily enough, but it's the trust that I build with clients that is, you know, truly my asset, I guess, or tr truly the backbone of my book of business. Right. So, yeah. That's so cool. I, I love that you prioritize building long-term trusted relationships with your clients and your partners, because I do think that that sets you apart and makes you um, more approachable and more, you know, like collaborative, which many creatives are used to. That's a spirit that, you know, most of us are accustomed to. Um, one thing that struck me as you were describing the startup of your business in particular is just we talk on this podcast about entrepreneurship and the challenges of entrepreneurship. And, you know, I think one of the topics that we as creatives and artists talk a lot about is the legitimacy of our work as a trade. And it's so fascinating from that lens to hear you talking about getting started and trying to get your footing and, you know, trying to build a book of business, build those relationships from the ground up, just the same as we are as theater practitioners or fine artists or musicians or anything like that. We're all going through the same entrepreneurial journey in many ways. Um, so, you know, like I, I think back about my, my Jewish grandma who was like, couldn't you be a lawyer? Couldn't you be a doctor? <laughs> and so like, it's, it's kind of the same, right? It's, it's very similar. <laughs> I think so. I, I mean, m even being a lawyer, my Jewish grandma was asking uh, whether I was still looking for a job, even after, you know, months 
of having my own firm. So, you know, that, that's, uh, I think that doesn't go away with a law degree. I can promise you. Jewish grandmas, they're insatiable. They can't be contained. <laughs> well, uh, one thing you and I talked about before this was how your relative, like, unfamiliarity, we'll say, with entertainment as a, as a field or as a vertical um, has given you another unique um, calling card, really, which is that you bring an uncommon approach to a lot of the um, the needs, the legal needs of the entertainment industry. I think one of the things you said that I found most interesting is that you find the entertainment industry is really not set up to benefit or be equitable to artists, and that has been a surprise to you. Can you talk more about that or, or share some examples in, in how you've come to that conclusion? As, as I mentioned, uh, a large part of the work that I did, especially at the early stages of my career and you know, even up until more recently, uh, included a lot of absolutely non-entertainment related business law work. And uh, there are some conventions that exist in other industries, the entertainment industry itself and of course, you know, again, within entertainment, you've got, you can even talk about film industry, music industry, and all of the conventions that exist within those industries. And a lot of it is also very secretive, right? So um, what ends up happening is a lot of people just end up adopting something that they read on the internet without stopping to think why, well, because it's done that way, right? And, and that's where a lot of uh, conversations tend to dead end about like why something is being done a particular way. Well, because that's how we do it in the film industry. That's how we do it in the, in the music industry. Uh, and as far as just trying to figure out, well, why? Uh, because there's this other concept that... I know from whatever other area of corporate law that would seemingly, you know, if you're treating the, the entertainer as an entrepreneur, as somebody that's got their own business, then applying those same principles from other areas of corporate law, uh, I think can have quite a bit of benefit for an entrepreneur who just happens to be in this particular industry. Um, that requires deviating from what everybody says is that's just how we do it. Right. So with the, the, the best I've come up with as for why people don't implement some of these, I, you know, let's call them tactics, but just, you know, principles from, other areas of business is just that whoever it was that decades ago decided that this is how we're going to do things. It was probably a, a big studio, a big music label, and they aligned things in a way that made sense for them. And of course their bottom line and the individuals that decades ago were much more dependent on these sorts of institutional participants, you know, um, they just kind of followed along and they kept following along, uh, as opposed to now, you know, I've, there's so much disruption, uh, insert buzzword, you know, here about whatever, uh, technology and the internet has done for, uh, creatives. And it's, it's really made it that people are able to run their businesses or run their creative ventures as businesses and try to implement some of these other uh, principles with, you know, attorneys or whoever it is that can actually suggest that they do these sorts of things that, that I would like to think benefit them uh, without really even negatively impacting anybody else. Right. It's, 
that's the thing. If it was a zero sum situation, I, I'd say, okay, I, I get it. You know, the other side of the deal doesn't benefit here. But uh, if it's one of those things where it doesn't impact anybody else negatively, but benefits the artist, uh, the entrepreneur as well, then why not implement that? Uh, and, you know, a large part of that, uh, I think, comes from not just me being a lawyer, but me being a business owner. You know, I can, I can say that running my own business has certainly made me a better lawyer for business owners. So that's, um, that's just something worth, worth thinking about. And thinking of my own business again, uh, you know, I wouldn't have been able to run my type of law firm 15 years ago, uh, where, you know, so much of everything that I do now is cloud-based. Uh, you know, we do, we Im certainly implement AI specific, you know, AI type of software within our business. Um, and you know, 15 years ago, I would have needed to have an office with file cabinets and, you know, then think about how I was going to cover the expenses of that as opposed to my software. Interesting. You know, like one of the things that struck me is you, you've talked about sort of where the artist sits in these um, processes, these legal journeys and, and uh, situations, for lack of a better word. Um, I think you described them to me as a, a being like a caboose. Is that something you see? What I meant when I said that was just they're following, right? There's somebody that's leading the charge on what it, how things need to be done. And uh, people are falling in line and uh, caboosing, uh, follow the leader sort of approach. Um, without necessarily asking why, again, th th that's what I was talking about. So yeah, just uh, getting to the core of why things done are, are done a particular way, I think is, is important. Uh, and certainly if, you know, you depend on somebody else for financing and that somebody else is telling you what to do, then, okay, well, you know, you gotta, if you want that financing, then you gotta fall in line and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But when that's not the case, I think some free thinking helps. I think free thinking and proactivity in general for creatives is like tantamount right now. Um, for our listeners, at the moment that we're recording this, um, the in the U.S., the actors and writers unions are on strike and have been for, I think, over 90 days Um and they're striking to pursue more equitable, better pay, better contracts, um, more equity when it comes to things like streaming, um, and more protections for their work and their image um, as there's more use of AI um, in things like the film and music industries in particular. Um, so, you know, Ilya, I think it's, just like perfect timing that we get to talk with you about these topics. Um, and I'm kind of curious about, you know, what do you think about the strikes overall? Do you feel like um, there's a special moment happening right now with this? Or, you know, how, how, how does it all strike you? <laughs> Pun intended. <laughs> good. good. I, I think it's, it's the natural course of things uh, with any sort of union that has a collective bargaining agreement in place, uh, they have an expiration date, the agreements do. And the union does its best to uh, implement the, the best deal at the time. Uh, and then when that deal expires, there's potential for renegotiation. And the strikes right now are in large part driven by the evolution of, well, of technology, but that leads to evolving income streams. And 
when the income streams um, are uh, are not balanced in terms of who it is that they benefit, uh, then I think it makes sense for the unions to certainly use their leverage again at the at the point when a particular agreement expires, right? So if you think about these deals lasting a while, um, the studios, the, the streaming services, they've had the benefit of years upon years at this point of getting revenues through some newer technology driven income streams. Uh, and there hasn't been much sharing of that wealth to, to artists. Well, now with the expiration of these deals, now the artists get to use their leverage that collective bargaining brings them and negotiate a new deal. And, you know, it's, th it's their right. Uh, maybe it's a little cynical to, you know, talk about it in contractual terms as opposed to, you know, human rights or anything like that. Uh, but that's just how I tend to think. Um, you know, now is the time for, for them to renegotiate. And speaking specific, uh, specifically about SAG uh, and actors, uh, you know, a lot of the productions that I'm working on right now, they're getting waivers from SAG because those productions are willing to accept the terms that SAG is asking for in its negotiations. So that's what also makes me say it's, it's a great agreement driven, right? Here, here are the terms under which we are willing to provide services for your production and green light your production. You agree to them. Great. Let's work. So that I think, I don't think um, the transactional nature of that is a negative. I, I think that it, it's, it makes perfect sense. Interesting. Let me unpack some of what you said, because first off, maybe it's because we are uh, dramatic people in the, in the cinematic arts. Um, but I did get this sense, you know, that um, so much of the strikes are based on sort of a social pressure, social movement. Um, and in some, some circles, you could even argue that it's, you know, anti-capitalist, anti-greed, anti, you know, CEOs and all of that. Um, but the way that you're talking about it is sort of making it sound like this, this collective bargaining is inevitable. Would you say that that's true? Well, the unions were formed in the first place for, for a reason, right? To, to protect the rights of workers. But at the end of the day, they exist to, uh, to actually help their uh, their members work under favorable circumstances, right? So with a strike, there's a lot of stress and tension, and that stems from the fact that people are not working. I'm talking about strikes in general, right? Uh, but at the end of the day, like SAG exists to get, I'll, I'll just say, get work for its members, right? It, under the right conditions. Uh, so they facilitate actually a lot of the interaction and uh, conditions relating to any given production and getting, getting their members to participate in, in the, in the making of a film. So uh, that's, I, I don't, uh, I, I view that as the number one thing that, that the, that the union, any union does is at the end of the day, it needs to lead to their members getting work and getting equitable work. Yeah. Well, right, right. Under, if, if people start to accept 
less favorable terms, then it becomes a race to the bottom. And that's what the union is trying to prevent. But uh, at the end of the day, if there are people who are willing to comply with the requests of the union, and, and at, the, at the end of the day, it needs to make sense, right? Because again, talking about film specifically, you're creating an asset that is supposed to ultimately make money. Yes, we all like films. Yes, a lot of films do lose money. But at the end of the day, like nobody's going into film production with the goal of losing money or, just, you know, setting up a situation where they're not even potentially generating revenue. Um, there's a lot of, you know, just general economics at play in making a film and unions are a real part of that. You know, I've, I've seen not every actor, not every writer is in a union, but uh, the ones that uh, you want to be working with, a lot of them are in the union. And, and so they need to abide by their obligations and uh, the productions need to enable them to do so uh, while still hopefully working and, and, you know, creating assets that have value. I hope I didn't just like completely take any charm out of filmmaking, you know, but you, you got to think of it as an asset because it's just too expensive of a, of a hobby. Well said. No, I, I, I think I'm, I'm all in favor of de-romanticizing uh, the arts business. <laughs> Generally speaking, uh, that tends to be um, a hill I'm happy to die on, uh, especially with this podcast, um, because I I think in order for us to sustain our practices, we have to be able to eat. So um, I wanted to ask another question um, related to the strikes, which is specifically about AI. Um, which is something that, I, admittedly, I don't know a lot about, but um, the use of, um, you know, AI-generated writing in TV and film and, you know, beyond, and, and the use of um, actors' images perpetually based on body scans and that kind of thing is really kind of fascinating, and I find... Um, terrifying. <laughs> um, when we talked about it earlier, you, you explained how, you know, so much of this is still theoretical. Can you talk a little bit more about AI and, and what you're seeing? So in general, law is always much slower to catch up than technology is at developing. And you end up with situations where you're applying decade old legal principles to technologies that just were introduced very recently. And a lot of the time it's, you know, square peg round hole as far as trying to match those up. Um, AI in particular, obviously, first of all, amazing and scary technology, at least, you know, generative AI as we're thinking about it right now, obviously artificial intelligence as a concept has been around for decades. Um, and I think what we're talking about generally right now is the generative AI that's really taken root over the last, I'll say year or two, although I'm sure people that are much more plugged in you know, they'll say 10 years, whatever. Um, but the technology itself, like any technology, it's a question of how it's used. And I mentioned earlier that like we use AI in our practice uh, for, for a variety of legal tasks and the specific software that I have access to that uh, I use 
I, it's more powerful in my hands than it is in the hands of somebody that that uh, is not a lawyer for, for the purposes of lawyering, right? So, uh, you know, when, when people ask me, and this is deviating a little bit from the from the uh, artist scenario, but when people ask me whether I'm afraid to lose my job because of AI, my answer is no, specifically because it's it's just a much more powerful tool in my hands than it is in somebody else's. Like nothing, almost nothing that I do uh, legally requires a law degree. You know, uh, a lot of what I do is type of pa paper pushing that if somebody knew what they were doing, they'd be able to do as well, uh, regardless of whether they were a lawyer or not. Uh, and it's just a question of, do you know what you don't know? And are you uh, going to spend the time on it? So I, I'm not afraid of losing my job to AI. So switching over to creative space, maybe it would be a little too cavalier to also say the same for, for people in the you know, creative space when their livelihood is tied to you know, creating a graphic and here's this software that creates graphics in seconds, you know, and, and obviously charges significantly less. And does that put somebody else out of business? Um, I, I mean, I can certainly see how that would be the case. I think analogizing back to lawyers, I think there's certainly lawyers that whose business would be impacted by that, you know, uh, but I always tend to think about just what if this tool was in the hands of somebody who is a professional in that space? And I'm sure that AI in the hands of artists is a very powerful thing for, for the creative process. Um, does it put people out of work? Yes, if, if their work is, if they're just not going to adapt and, you know, have their, their jobs also incorporate technology, new technologies that come out. Uh, and I don't, I don't feel sorry for businesses that don't adapt, that go out of business. Um, and I, it probably makes me sound like a real, you know, not, not good person. I don't know, but yeah. Uh, so, so, I mean, I, I would encourage people to explore how they can incorporate AI into their business, um, uh, and make their business more efficient in the process. Now, in the creative space in particular, and we started this about legal and, and the fact that the law just doesn't always catch up as quickly. Uh, you know, AI doesn't just invent stuff um, out of absolutely nowhere, although obviously plenty of stories about hallucinations and such, but at least for for images, um, my understanding is that it, it uses what's already out there, right? And the questions about fairness come up when your work is actually serving as the baseline uh, for what the AI is creating, right? The, in, in effect, the technology is copying uh, your work. And that's really where a lot of the current legal battles are going to end up being. Uh, and, and it's a little bit theoretical right now, because at least personally, I'm unaware of cases where specifically that's been analyzed, specifically generative AI 
relative to, let's say, graphics that have been copied. Um, you know, the Copyright Office, as of, as of today, has put out a few uh, documents that provide guidelines for protecting works that have been created with AI. But I personally am unaware of cases where that's specifically been uh, dealt with by a court that, like, yay or nay, this is copying or not copying. Now, there has been, uh, or from earlier this year, a decision uh, relating to the fair use doctrine. That's the Andy Warhol Foundation versus Goldsmith case. That would, you know, that doesn't have anything directly to do with AI. But in terms of, you know, that's just the photography uh, versus silkscreen and licensing of the silkscreen for a magazine cover as opposed to, you know, the photograph potentially being licensed. Uh, th that's what that situation is. But the same, but the principles that come out of that about, you know, what is, uh, the type of transformation that the fair use doctrine is allowed to, is supposed to protect, uh, those questions still remain. And, uh, that's why I'm talking about it as, as theoretical rather than, uh, you know, anything that there's a definitive responses on, right? Like until a judge rules one way or the other, and who knows, maybe that's already happened. I'm just unaware of it. Imagine I would have heard of it. Um, the until that's happened, we're all just kind of mentally not. I don't want to get vulgar. Uh, it, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm making it all up as we go along. It, it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. In, well, yeah, and the technology is also moving so fast in and of itself. So, like, it's like trying to grab a fish. Um, <laughs> um, well, I want to talk more about, you know, the sort of the specific tactical things when we consider things like intellectual property and fair use and contracts and that kind of thing. So, you know, this is the part of the episode where I'd like to get a little bit more strategic. Um, so let's talk, let's focus on contracts specifically. What are some considerations that you think specifically actors and writers should be paying attention to going forward, you know, with all of these these uh, given circumstances, are there any red flags or like potential risks that they should really be focused on? Uh, a, a lot of uh, at least copyright specific contract principles. Um, you know, one of the one of the things that is just a, a matter of law in, in the U.S. at least is that you can't transfer rights in a copyright. Uh, without a written agreement, at least, you know, not permanently transfer. So the counter, you know, th there's been a lot of, there's been a lot of instances where people just haven't gotten agreements in writing, thinking that they had, well, I paid somebody, so now I've acquired this, the rights to this, but that just, you know, without a written agreement, there's not that transfer of rights. And the best case scenario is that you have a license agreement that could be getting uh, revoked if, you know, that relationship goes sour. But the other side of the coin of that is that most things, I'd say probably 90% of terms in a written agreement, are if you can, if you think it and you put it on paper and both sides agree, it's going to be enforceable. So, you know, the truism is just obviously be careful what you sign, understand the terms that, you know, that, that you're signing, duh. Right. So get, get it in writing and understand what you're signing. Um, 
Now, with the creative space in particular, I think that there's a few things. Um, first of all, I, I find that it's helpful to think about compensation versus rights as a sliding scale um, in that the more you're compensated, the more rights you should be willing to give away and vice versa. So uh, the an agreement often ha other than just the money, uh, regardless of whether the money is paid now or later, although, you know, if it's paid later, then consider time value of money and what that should translate into what you're getting paid, right? The, the more you're getting paid now, uh, if, if Sorry, the longer the delay, the more you should be getting paid, right? Uh, as just a thought specifically on money and deals and contracts. But uh, also there's a lot of non-monetary provisions that, are, that exist in these agreements, uh, whether it's uh, about control or credit or uh, other dynamics in an agreement that, that aren't that, that aren't actually specific to this is what you're getting paid. A lot of that stuff has value, right? Um, also, the, the flip side is what is the person that's providing the compensation? What are they getting in in exchange? What, what is it? What is the package of rights that they're securing for themselves? And that's where the sliding scale comes in, right? The more rights they're getting, the more they should be paying for it. The more rights you're reserving, the less you should be getting paid. Uh, and so as somebody's going through a negotiation, I find that it's helpful to, uh, whenever you see somebody requesting terms that you don't want, uh, don't just say, no, nope, deal breaker, goodbye. Uh, think about it in terms of uh, not at this price. So, you know, if you want these additional rights, then I'm perfectly happy to give them to you, but you're going to have to pay me this much more, and it might be exponentially more. Uh, you know, that's, that's a business decision to be made and market forces, yada, yada, yada. But... Uh, the more, the more you're getting, the more you should be paying. So that's just one thing that I think seems very obvious once you say it, but a lot of people, when they're in contract negotiations, they get stuck. And as, as a tactic, I think it, it's also helpful as a starting point, if you're an artist, uh, when you're providing a quote on whatever services, trying to reserve some rights at the outset. Uh, and that then gives you that opportunity that if they want those rights, you're happy to give them for more money or for whatever it is that gives you value. You gave me pause here and I'm, I'm going to, throw you like a softball question here but i i want i want our youngest most emerging creatives to hear you say this when a contract comes to you with terms that you don't agree with or that you can't comply with or that you'd rather it be something else should you counter <laughs> Should you um, ask for something different? Is it is it um, acceptable to do that? I mean, I think it's it's absolutely acceptable. Uh, you know, worst case that scenario that happens is somebody says no, and you know maybe it has a a chance of throwing off a deal, but realistically, you should be getting a counter or you should be ready to give a counter. Um, you know, in some circumstances, there's just nothing to counter because 
for some practical reason, the other side requires certain things. Um, anybody going into a negotiation needs to know what their walkaway point is, right? Doesn't matter how, how big the other party is, uh, you know, how prestigious it would be to work with them, which by the way is, is non-monetary value, right? Being able to say that I worked with so-and-so, uh, I mean, I think this, this is a good example, actually. Very, very big company, next level type of client. You get a lot of uh, uh, benefit out of being able to specifically say, I work with this massive party. Well, a lot of these uh, bigger companies, they might have a policy that, you know, they're not going to allow people to throw their name around as, you know, like I worked on this project. And they might have good reasons for that, you know, in terms of why they have that policy. But uh, if they're going to not let you be able to get that non-monetary benefit in, in your marketing, then maybe that's perfectly fine, but they need to be paying you more, right? And, and so that's... Um, because, you know, you're perfectly happy to be... Uh, unable to use their name if instead you got a big bag of money uh, in exchange for your silence and services, of course. So uh, plan to counter um, with things that you care about and know what, what your walkaway point is going to be. Uh, I think that that's always going to be important uh, and then you know not every deal is going to work out but uh and sometimes you're going to get a bad deal for for the experience uh but you know you should be the one deciding whether that experience is worth it to you you shouldn't be letting somebody else tell you oh this is a great opportunity for you to work with me so you know you better accept these you know these terms um Here's the other thing. A lot of PDFs versus editable, let's say, Microsoft Word documents, okay? Um, if, if the goal is to have a negotiation that makes it easy for the other side to provide you with their proposals so that you don't have to be the one that has to update the document, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Then work with editable documents, and, I, and of course, it makes it easy to um, to run red lines and see the changes. And so then, especially as you get into subsequent rounds of negotiations, it can really expedite the process uh, to be able to run these comparisons and not take a, a long time every time reviewing. Oh, what's different? Um, a lot of the time you might get a, a, a PDF as, as a, as a document, uh, for, as a contract for you to sign. My approach is to always, unless it's just very obvious that this makes sense to sign, uh, is always to request a Microsoft Word document. Um, I've, I mean, I've got software that can pretty well convert a PDF into a Word doc, right? The, the function of it is not really the, the problem, although the conversion is still not perfect, right? So wouldn't it be nice to be working with the original document? But it's really more uh, as a litmus test for how the other side is approaching the negotiation. Um, if... Uh, a lot of the time you, you get a Word doc to begin with, that's an invitation for you and your lawyer or, or to provide revisions, right? That, that, that's great. Other times somebody might think that they're making life easier by sending you a PDF when really they're, they're not, or maybe they're hoping that you'll just sign off, which is you know a legitimate enough approach. But once you request the, the Word doc, they should be absolutely willing to give it to you because you need, 
it, it, it will, it's not just to make your life easier. It's also to make their life easier. It's going to make it that much easier for them to subsequently see what you changed and it makes the negotiation flow. So if for whatever reason they, they decide to not give you a PDF, or excuse me, a Microsoft Word doc or whatever the editable software is, um, that's a red flag because it shows either an experience with a negotiation or it, you know, worst case scenario is some sort of bad faith, um, not an equal bargaining, uh, partner, not somebody that, so somebody that just wa wants to force their agreement through on you and, and not facilitate a positive negotiation. Wow. That so intuitively makes sense, but I would never have thought about it so practically. Great point. I hope that helps. <laughs> um, I don't even remember the original question that you asked uh, that that was hopefully an on-point response for, but whatever. I think it was like, what red flags or what risks should creatives be looking for when they're you know doing their contracting and i think that that's a great place to start with um so changing gears a little bit um <laughs> when you and i talked <laughs> one of the things that made me laugh is like you pointed out rightly that i am like the poster child for my my audience in terms of needing legal guidance, in terms of not knowing a lot about, you know, how to set myself up for success from a legal vantage point. Um, and you gently, ever so diplomatically, <laughs> suggested I might be interested in registering copyrights for my existing content like this very podcast. I don't know anything about that. So just, you know, in a in a little blurb, can you explain why I should be doing that and like how I would even get started? I assume you view the content that you create as having value. I try. Right. And, um, you know, the, the things that you aren't going to protect through copyright registration or any of the ideas we're talking about, copyright's not designed for that, facts that we're talking about, not going to be protectable. Um, so, you know, somebody else can make this sort of podcast talk about very similar things. I'm sure we're not necessarily even talking about things that are like super duper original. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah, take offense. Um, I'm, I'm not talking about things that are super duper original. You know, I, I won't speak for you. Um, but at the end of the day, there's a video and that video is going to end up on YouTube, right? And somebody else, whether abroad or uh, in the US, might be posting that video uh, elsewhere and depriving you of the income stream that might come from views. Uh, it might be confusing people as to what the source is uh, of of the work, um, and you know, with to ha truly have any sort of meaningful way of enforcing your rights, a lot of artists hear that like as soon as you create it, it's protected, and it's true in that you know for something to be copyrightable, it needs to reach that minimum level of or originality and uh, also be fixed in a tangible medium. So, you know, the stuff that we talked about, it's gonna meet that, uh, at least in terms of the original video, uh, it's gonna meet that originality uh, standard. It's also going to uh, be fixed in, in a digital file, which is still a tangible medium. Um, and it, it's going to be, protected, uh, technically speaking. But if somebody does end up 
taking the content. And again, we're talking about this podcast, but we can be talking about anything. And you put out other content as well, and obviously your viewers do. So in order to be able to actually enforce your rights, first of all, you can't file a lawsuit uh, without actually having registered your copyright in the U.S. Um, specific to, to U.S. artists, specific to U.S. Uh, obviously enforcement of rights in the U.S. Um, so, so, I mean, that's, that's a baseline. But you can, obviously, you see your rights infringed, you then go and you register your copyrights. Unfortunately, there's some benefits that you end up losing if you don't have what we'll talk about as a timely registration. And what a timely registration is, it's either uh, effective date of the registration is before the beginning of an infringement, or it's within three months of the first publication of the work, right? So if you post something online and it's stolen the next day, and you know the infringement now has begun before you registered it, you still have that three month window. But if you're outside of that three month window, often the, the driver for people to start registering their works is because they now see somebody stealing their stuff, right? So uh, a lot of the time that's a painful lesson at the beginning when you're like, oh, okay, well, you don't have a timely copyright registration. So what is it that you lose? First of all, you can't claim statutory damages. Statutory damages are, uh, it's a range uh, that the law specifically says, minimum of uh, $750 per work, uh, maximum of $30,000 per work, which obviously is a very big range to begin with. That's for non-willful infringement. And then if it's willful infringement, then it's up to $150,000 per work, which doesn't mean that a court would actually definitely award that, but it's something that allows you to not necessarily have to prove that your content has any value to begin with, right? You know that at an absolute minimum, it's, it's 750 bucks, uh, which you know, if you can prove that your content has even more value, then great, you'll be, you know, further up on the scale. Um, and the statutory damages are also uh, not going to be a one for one thing, right? Like you need to have some sort of disincentive for somebody to steal your stuff. So it's not like, oh, I licensed my stuff for, you know, $750. So now statutory damages are only going to be $750. No, it's going to be some multiple of that. And then there's also going to be other factors included, you know, deterring somebody from participating in that sort of behavior, et cetera. The other very important benefit that you get with a timely copyright registration is um, potential of getting attorney's fees awarded. So obviously that matters, right? For somebody like me to be able to come in and actually uh, be able to enforce your rights for you. It's great to, to be able to then subsequently claim attorney's fees. That's what makes it tenable and affordable uh, to actually try to enforce your rights. And we're talking about filing lawsuits and what happens when you file a lawsuit, but it's also leverage. So, the fact that these potential remedies are available can often lead to much higher pre pre-suit settlements than if you didn't have those remedies available to you and you had to prove what the value was and you had to, you know, if you were dealing with an attorney, you had to hire, you had to pay for that attorney's services and not have any potential of being able to recoup that. So uh, purely as a negotiating uh, value, there's a lot of value in being able to have those potential remedies, which only come with having registered your works. Um, yeah, so I, I don't want to keep blabbering on about, about it, but uh, 
if, if you're creating content, then it, the, it makes sense to register it. And it's a pretty good bang for buck. Um, there's some nuances about, you know, how many works you can register on a single application, whether you're doing it before it's been published versus after it's been published. But at the end of the day, like if, if you view your, what you create as an asset, it makes sense to be registering it with the U.S. Copyright Office. And, and a lot of people also confuse U.S. Copyright Office with other registrations, right? So, uh, oh, I registered my screenplay with the WGA. Great, not the same thing. Um, so U.S. Copyright Office is your friend, and that's who the registration should be. I will get right on that. Thank you. <laughs> you can feel good knowing you've already made an impact. <laughs> um, so to that end, um, as we're kind of wrapping up, I have a couple of, I think, important questions to ask you. Um, many of us creatives have been handling our legal contracts and everything personally, directly. So how and when should we really consider seeking professional legal advice? Like how, when do we bring in the big guns basically? It's good to network in general. So don't be shy about, you know, reaching out to an attorney, uh, even with substantive questions, um, can't speak for everybody, but you know, people should be upfront about when they need to start charging for something. So, you know, if somebody tells you, or rather I should say, if somebody doesn't tell you that they're charging you for it, I mean, I guess feel free to ask to verify, but you would think it's a given. Um, but what I like to think about as like a good entry point for someone like me is uh, any next level opportunity that you're getting. At the early stage of your business, you absolutely should be minding your cash flow. Lawyers might seem and might be a luxury that you feel like you can't afford at the outset. Fine. You, I mentioned there's very little that I do that actually requires a law license. There's, you know, there's the internet. There's a lot of stuff out there on the internet. Um, the challenge might be that you don't know what's a perfect fit versus a perfect fit for the other guy. But let's say, you know, you do your due diligence and you put together your own agreement uh, based on things that you found and it works perfectly well at the early stages of your business. Great. If, if it's working, wonderful. Um, the next level opportunity stuff that I'm talking about is like, let's say you've got this opportunity and it's just for much, much, much higher, uh, dollar amounts than what you're used to. Uh, it seems like it's, uh, you know, a higher risk, but higher reward. So maybe you would feel more comfortable working with an attorney at that stage. Maybe you send over your DIY agreement to the other side and the other side is lawyered up, or even if they're not lawyered up and they come back and just, it's all red line uh, whatever it is that you sent them. Uh, maybe that's the point at which you feel, Ooh, I, I would feel more comfortable if I had somebody that, that had a little more experience with these agreements. Uh, those are, I'd say the, the types of situations where, you know, it's easy for an attorney to come in and provide value, right? Yes, there is a cost uh, associated with it, with the services, presumably, um, but the higher dollar amounts also justify the transactional cost associated with it. Um, you know, I like to say that with clients, it's my goal that paying my invoices becomes a hobby for them uh, because the opportunities are there and the value that they're getting out of having an attorney uh, that's experienced specifically, you know, not every attorney does the same stuff, right? So specifically an attorney that knows what they're doing in that particular space, um, 
the the benefits make it worth it to have that transactional cost. And that's a decision for every entrepreneur to make for themselves. Well said. What would you say to creatives who feel like they need to retain your services, but they can't even imagine that they'd be able to afford you? I mean, I, I would say there's, there's a lot of situations actually in which, you know, people end up hiring, uh, let's say a service like legal zoom or uh, something that they think makes things easier and saves, saves them money. Um, There are some things that I have found retroactively that I actually charge less for, let's say, than a service like that. But even if we're not talking about any sort of services like that, um, and you're just thinking about yourself. I mean, you won't know if it's worth it or not, or what the cost might be without asking. Uh, my personal philosophy, as I mentioned, is that it's my duty to tell somebody when I need to start charging for them, uh, for, for whatever services, uh, entertainment, um, entertainment law in general. And, and I mentioned the reason I even got involved in this space is because People are long-term minded and so oftentimes there's just some handholding and cons- consultation that goes into it at the, into a, a business relationship at the beginning, maybe that I'm not even charging for. Uh, but again, you won't know and, uh, unless you ask and I'm speaking only for myself, but there's plenty of other attorneys out there that also do what, uh, what you do, uh, excuse me, what I do. Um, I also talked, you know, at the beginning about my approach when I was at the very, very beginning of my career. And uh, if you find somebody who's at the beginning of their legal career, uh, you know, they could very well be uh, a good resource for you. They'll put in the time. Uh, They might not have the years and years of experience, but uh, they still have a good amount of experience and they might be a uh, more affordable option or um, just in general uh, a good resource looking for somebody to give them a chance the same way that you're looking for somebody to give you a chance. And finally, also there's organizations um, such as Lawyers for the Creative Arts, uh, you know, focused on providing pro bono legal services, focused on providing uh, reduced rate legal services. Those are great uh, resources that you can reach out to. Um, The turnaround might not be, uh, you know, immediate because that's just the the nature of, you know, cheaper services, I think in general, right? Um, That sometimes they might not be the fastest, but uh, the attorneys that you get paired with are, I think very good and going to be helpful. I love it. We're, we're big fans of lawyers for the creative arts at Smartistry. Yeah. And I love to hear that you do some work with them as well. So as we wrap up our conversation, Ilya, which has, this has been so informative and um, I, I love getting like, so, you know, in deep on the tactical stuff. And I know you and I are going to talk a lot more about that in the future. Um, Just tell us and and our um, audience, what's next for you and and where can they find you and your services? My firm recently underwent a rebrand. And so it's lacking can entertainment is a relatively new thing. Uh, Figuring out what the URL should be uh, is also, you know, part of a rebrand and, and, Easier said than done. Uh, so on the internet, we're at zce.law. I was lacking can entertainment uh, for ZCE. Uh, as far as uh, other um, pl- plans for the future, um, we're, uh, again, focusing entirely on the creative space in terms of you know, new business uh, that's um, 
a a goal uh, and it's been you know to the to the point of where we're letting some of our other business go um so you know specifically creative space um and then long term we'll we'll see how things develop again uh, film is a particular area of interest for me uh and I'm hoping that several years down the line, we're providing not just legal services, but then also have a, a separate um, part of the business where we're helping package and sell film projects. Um, so it's all very hypothetical at the moment, but that's just kind of a long-term goal. Love it. And I love to hear an entrepreneur talking about goal setting. We're, we're very about that on this podcast. Um, Ilya, thank you so much. Uh, to all of our smartest, you can find information about Ilya's firm on the Smartest Portal. Um, just look for our trusted resource partners and you'll, you'll find um, his firm there. Ilya, thank you so much for your time. This has been a great conversation. Thanks so much, Melissa. Pleasure. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you soon. <laughs>